Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode of my history series where today I'm finding myself wondering if I'm genuinely a little bit crazy or if I'm just craving drama in my life because today we're talking vaccines. Nothing controversial to see here. Genuinely nothing controversial. Today we're going to be taking a trip back in time to the invention of the modern vaccine to Edward Jenner and his creation of the smallpox vaccine. This video was originally meant to be about the history of vaccines as a whole, but as I began writing it I realised I had enough for a whole episode on the smallpox vaccine alone. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today before I make a full video on the history of vaccines at another point pretty soon. I know vaccines in general is a topic that can cause heated discussion and I want to preface this episode by saying that we're talking facts, science and history in this video. No drama, just history and science as it happened. Discussion in the comments is always welcome, of course, but conspiracy theories are not. We are not about spreading misinformation over here on my channel. That is the antithesis of what my channel is. And if I deem a comment to be harmful, I will be deleting it. And no, me deleting comments on my own channel is not hurting your freedom of speech. You're welcome to make your own channels and talk about your stuff on your own platforms. This one is mine and I have freedom to use that sweet, sweet delete button. So discussion, good, conspiracies with no backy in science, bad, got it? Good, let's get into the video. Let's begin by talking about smallpox, a contagious, deadly disease that blighted humanity for thousands of years. A disease that because of vaccines has now been officially eradicated worldwide as of 1980. It no longer exists apart from in two vials. One at the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Russia's State Research Center of Virology and Biotechnology. No cure or treatment for smallpox exists or has ever really existed. It was the vaccine that brought it to an end. The last known case was actually in the UK in September 1978 when a medical photographer called Janet Parker contracted it whilst working at Birmingham University's medical school. On the floor below where Janet worked, the medical microbiology department were conducting smallpox research and although it's not entirely known how Janet contracted the disease, it's thought that she either had direct contact with the virus whilst visiting the microbiology corridor or it had been airborne through the school's duct system. The virus can be transmitted directly from person to person through droplets that escape when an infected person coughs, sneezes or talks. You can get it indirectly from an infected person, such as through ventilation systems or via contaminated items, so an ill person touches an object that you then touch. Janet fell ill on August 11th and developed a rash four days later, and nine days after that she was officially diagnosed with smallpox. She sadly died on September 11th, 1978. Her mother was the one caring for her and she also developed the first signs of smallpox on September 7th, despite receiving the vaccine two weeks earlier. As far as I could find though, Janet's mother did survive. But even back in 1978, Janet and her mother contracting smallpox was a fluke. The last known naturally occurring case was a year earlier in October 1977 in Somalia. Ali Mal Malin caught the disease whilst working as a hospital cook and he rode with two smallpox patients from the hospital to the local smallpox office. He developed a fever 10 days after the trip and smallpox was so rare at this point already that he was diagnosed with malaria at first, then chickenpox. It was eight days after that that he was correctly diagnosed with smallpox, put in isolation and did end up making a full recovery. Now there were two variants of the smallpox virus. There was variola major and variola minor. Ali had contracted variola minor. The last natural case of variola major was in late 1975 when three-year-old Rahima Banu from Bangladesh contracted it. She was isolated at home with guards at the door for 24 hours a day until she was no longer contagious. Every person living within a 1.5 mile radius of Rahima's home was vaccinated and a member of the smallpox eradication program visited every single house and building within five miles to ensure it hadn't spread. Clearly this was effective as Rahima was the last person in Asia to have smallpox and she survived. 
And believe me, it is great news that smallpox has been eradicated because this disease was brutal. I would not wish this on anyone. The first symptoms of smallpox usually appear 10 to 14 days after infection and according to the Mayo Clinic during this incubation period you can't infect anyone else so you're not contagious until symptoms start to show. Said symptoms are kind of flu-like so fever, discomfort, headaches, severe fatigue, severe back pain and vomiting. A few days later, flat red spots appear on your face, hands and forearms and eventually on the trunk of your body. This was a very visual disease. A couple of days after they appear, the lesions turn into blisters or pustules filled with clear fluid that turns to pus. Eight to nine days after that, the blisters turn into scabs and they fall off, leaving deep pitted scars. Three in ten people wouldn't survive that far though. What would get you would usually be the complications in the respiratory system, so you'd get anything from bronchitis to pneumonia, which would generally kick in around day eight. As I mentioned previously, there's no cure or treatment for smallpox, only the prevention in the form of the vaccine. However, it is found that smallpox vaccination within three days of exposure will prevent or significantly lessen the symptoms in the vast majority of people, and vaccination four to seven days after will offer some protection. Other than that though, there's not much you can do, it's just about supportive treatment, looking after the wounds and staying comfortable. Pre-vaccine, there was nothing that could be done except for just hoping that you'd be in the surviving percentage. 70% of people would survive, but even if you were in that percentage, things weren't always going to be easy from there. One in 500 people would get encephalitis, inflammation on the brain, and that can cause temporary or permanent disability. In about 2% of cases, your eyes would be affected, the pustules can basically form in your eye, that can lead to a whole bunch of complications and occasionally even cause blindness. If you caught smallpox as a kid and survived, you might struggle with joint and bone problems for the rest of your life. But the biggest sign of a smallpox survivor would be the pock marks, these deep pitted scars all over your body, but most obviously on your face. It's widely thought that the reason for the thick white makeup of the 16th century was because of these pock marks. Queen Elizabeth I contracted smallpox aged 29 in 1562 and that left her face scarred and pitted. To cover these scars she took to wearing thick white lead makeup known as Venetian ceruse. As we know now, lead is pretty dangerous in itself and the side effects of this can cause skin discoloration, hair loss and just general illness. So if you see this white makeup of the Tudor period, that's why it was because of smallpox. You might have spotted before on your parents, or even on yourself if you're in the 10% of my audience over the age of 45, a deep pitted scar on their arm where they had the smallpox vaccine as a child. I know my mum has one, I always wondered what it was. Imagine that deep pitted scar but over your entire body, over your entire face. In some communities that could lead to you becoming an outcast is a sign that you've had this deadly disease and people would no longer want to associate with you. All of which I think brings us very nicely to the real point of this video, the vaccine and how it was created. For that, we need to travel back in time a couple of hundred years to when smallpox was ravaging the world. Actually, let's go back further than that. Let's go back to the 6th century when increased trade with China and Korea brought smallpox to Japan. And then a century later, more increased trade took it to Northern Africa, Spain and Portugal. By the 16th century, European settlers and the African slave trade imported smallpox to the Caribbean and Central and South America, then North America, and by the 18th century, the British brings it to Australia. It's worldwide. It was in the 15th century that the Chinese first recognised that people who had contracted smallpox before then became immune to reinfection, and they came up with the idea of variolation, which is the name taken straight from the name of the variola virus that caused smallpox. The Chinese would preserve scabs from people who had suffered with more mild cases of the disease. They would dry out these scabs and then crush them up into a powder before blowing them up the nostril. It's unclear how effective this was as inoculation, but the basic idea was there, and people did usually develop smallpox symptoms after this, such as a fever and a rash, 
but fewer people died than if they had acquired the disease naturally. Variolation wasn't foolproof, but it worked well enough for quite a few centuries. It travelled outside of China and eventually it was being used across the whole world. But then came a man called Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner was born in Berkeley, Gloucestershire on the 17th of May 1749. He was the eighth of nine children born to the local vicar and his wife. He went to school in Wootton under Edge and Sirencester and was inoculated for smallpox using this variolation technique. And this would have a lifelong effect on his health. When Jenner was 14, he became apprenticed under a man called Daniel Ludlow, who was a surgeon. And he would learn everything he needed to become a surgeon himself. In 1770, he began at St George's Hospital in London to complete his medical training before returning to Berkeley two years later to establish himself as the local practitioner and surgeon. And that is essentially where he would remain for the rest of his life. Like all other doctors in this time, Edward carried out variolation to inoculate his patients against smallpox, but he was never fully sold on the technique. He knew it made him ill as a child and he thought there must be better out there. And as well as his interest in medicine, he'd also always had a passion for nature. This was a man with big ambition. His first big scientific discovery was how cuckoos were able to get his chicks raised by birds of other species. And he was also one of the first people to study bird migration. He made such a name for himself that Captain Cook, the famous British explorer, offered him a place on his second expedition, which Jenna turned down to focus on medicine. His interest in animals and nature is important to note because it meant that he paid attention to the world around him. He noted, as many others had before him, that milkmaids were generally immune to smallpox. They just didn't catch it and it was speculated that cowpox was the reason for this. Milkmaids were often exposed to cowpox in their jobs and that provided a level of protection for them. From my research, the first person to make this connection was English physician John Fuster in 1768. And then in the next couple of years, at least five people in England and Germany tested this hypothesis with a basic vaccine made from cowpox. However, it was Edward Jenner who made this procedure more widely understood and his particular contribution to it was unique. Cowpox is similar to smallpox, kinda. It's a viral skin infection that's caused by a variation of the same variola virus that causes smallpox in humans. And despite the name, it doesn't just affect cows. It can be found in rodents, cats, humans, and more. It doesn't commonly naturally occur in humans, but it was often found that milkmaids would get infected through the sores the virus would cause on the udders of a cow, which would cause pustules to form on their hands, and maybe a slight fever, but that was about it. It's generally not that dangerous in cows or humans though. People wouldn't die from cowpox. In May 1796, a dairymaid called Sarah Nelms came to Edward about a rash on her hands and he quickly gave her the cowpox diagnosis when she confirmed that one of her cows, Blossom, had recently had cowpox. Sarah also told him that she had never had smallpox before. Now Edward had been thinking about this cowpox smallpox connection for quite a while and he saw Sarah as his chance to test his hypothesis. He thought that cowpox could not only protect somebody against smallpox but also that it could be transmitted from person to person as a deliberate mechanism of protection. In a very shaky ethical move that definitely would not be allowed today, Edward took scrapings of the pustules on Sarah's hands and on the 14th of May 1796 inoculated the eight-year-old son of his gardener, James Phipps. Jenna cut into James's skin and intentionally infected him with matter from a cowpox sore. Now I did try to do a bit of research on James Phipps but honestly there's not loads of information out there. Actually there's not anything out there. I don't even know if Jenna would have been entirely honest with James's parents about what he was doing, or if he was, whether they would have understood it fully. This was a big risk that he was taking. But the risk paid off because over the next week, James came down with a slight fever, he had a headache and lost his appetite, but by around the 10th day, he was fully recovered and Jenna wrote that he was perfectly well. 
But of course, this was only half the experiment. He had only infected him with cowpox. Six weeks later, in July 1796, Jenner infected James with smallpox, or at least with matter from a fresh smallpox lesion. This was a huge risk. There was technically a 30% chance that James would get ill and die from this. Again, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in that conversation with his parents. But a miracle happened and James remained perfectly healthy. He never showed any symptoms of smallpox. It wasn't even that he got smallpox and it was mild or he got smallpox and survived. He didn't have it at all, zero symptoms. Jenna's hypothesis had been correct. But of course, things weren't gonna be easy from there. You will hear lots of criticism of Jenna and how he's attributed to being the first person to discover the vaccine. But as we covered, his idea wasn't unique. Other people have been thinking along these lines for decades. But Jenna's unique contribution was that he inoculated people with cowpox and then proved that this caused them to be immune to smallpox. And he demonstrated that the cowpox pus could be inoculated from person to person, not just directly from cattle. After James, Jenner tested his hypothesis on 23 more people, all of which were successful. Although he did actually have to wait two years after James until he found another case of cowpox in humans to repeat this experiment, because cowpox in humans wasn't all that common. This was scientific perseverance at its best. And of course, also wasn't easy to find people who were willing to be his test subjects. Jenna travelled to London in search of volunteers, but struggled to find any. He did eventually give the vaccine to a surgeon called Henry Klein, and then some of Henry's patients got given it as well, and eventually it spread further from there, but it was very much an uphill battle. The year after James, Jenna did send correspondence to the Royal Society describing what he'd found, his experiments and his observations, but the paper was rejected. The next year, in 1798, he privately published a booklet entitled An Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the Variola Vaccine, a disease discovered in some of the western countries of England, particularly Gloucestershire and known by the name of cowpox. A real snappy title, it really draws you in, doesn't it? Over the two years after that, he would publish the results of further experiments, all of which just confirmed his original findings. In 1801, he published a treatise on the origin of vaccine inoculation. He'd called his technique vaccination, after the Latin word for cowpox, vaccina, further derived from the Latin word for cow, vaxa. But, no shock to anyone, vaccines didn't actually catch on at first. They were actually met with a lot of opposition. In this treatise, Jenner summarised all of his discoveries over the previous few years, and he expressed his wish that the vaccine could lead to the annihilation of smallpox, which he called the most dreadful scourge on the human species. One of the reasons that Jenna struggled to get vaccines to catch on was that cowpox wasn't all that common, and if a doctor wanted to test this new technique, test this new hypothesis, they had to get cowpox matter from Jenna himself, which led to questions. Also, infection at this point in time wasn't really understood, this was before germ theory and all of that, so cowpox samples would often actually be contaminated with actual smallpox or other diseases. The situations where the cowpox samples would be used the most often were in smallpox hospitals or where variolation was being done, making cross-contamination really easy. And plus, a lot of people didn't want vaccination to be successful, as most doctors and surgeons made a huge part of their living through variolation. And then you just had the anti-vax crowd, who yes, have been around since the birth of the vaccine. More religious people didn't want to receive material that had originated from cows because they refused to be treated with substances originating from God's lowlier creatures. And then of course there were the people who were just downright sceptical. In 1802 a satirical cartoon was actually published showing vaccinated people sprouting cow's heads. But despite all of this opposition, the effectiveness of vaccination couldn't be denied. And once Jenner had a few more doctors backing up his claims, the use of vaccines spread like wildfire. By 1802, the practice had spread across mainland Europe. And Jenner never attempted to make huge money through his discovery. And whilst he of course received much recognition and many honours for it, his only wish was to end smallpox. 
He actually devoted so much time to smallpox that his private practice at home really suffered. He probably lost money because of it. In 1802, Parliament did grant him £10,000 and then five years later another £30,000 to recompense him and recognise his work. He spent the rest of his life supplying cowpox materials to others around the world and he called himself the vaccine clerk of the world. As well as all of this, he developed a technique for taking matter from human cowpox pox and drying them onto thread so it could be easily transported. By 1840, the technique of variolation was forbidden by an Act of Parliament and 13 years later, in 1853, vaccination with cowpox was made compulsory. There were many protests against this. People marched in the streets and demanded freedom of choice. But there's no denying that the smallpox vaccine, it worked. As I mentioned earlier in the video, we don't have smallpox anymore, we don't have to worry about it anymore. It's a disease without effective treatment or a cure, even today. Without a vaccine, it's likely something we'd still be worrying about in 2021. So there's no denying that the vaccine did very much help with the eradication of the disease. At some point in the 1800s, the virus used to make the smallpox vaccine change from cowpox to the variola virus. It just got a little bit more techy. It was in 1967 that the World Health Organization launched its campaign to eliminate smallpox worldwide. At that time, it's estimated there were still up to 15 million cases of smallpox globally every year, with the biggest problem areas being South America, Africa, and the Indian subcontinent. With new technology in the form of being able to produce more higher quality freeze-dried vaccine and the development of the bifurcated needle, they set on a mission to vaccinate every person in the areas at risk, with teams of vaccinators heading to the most remote of communities. Just 13 years after this, on the 8th of May 1980, the World Health Organization formally declared that smallpox was dead, 184 years after Edward Jenner set out on his mission. It's considered to be the biggest achievement in international public health in history. I usually end these videos by talking about where we're at now with the disease, but quite simply, it's not a disease we have to worry about anymore. It's gone, apart from in those two labs in Russia and in the USA. A lot of people do worry about it being potentially used as a bioweapon, because it very much has been in the past, particularly by the British in war times, and it's never not a risk that it could escape these labs, but it's not really something that you should spend time pondering over. Likelihood is, that's never going to happen. The samples are actually afforded higher security than a nuclear bomb, which is concerning to me anyway, because like, why are we not giving nuclear bombs better security? But now the smallpox virus is just being used for research with the aim that one day, when there's nothing more that can be taken from them, they will be destroyed. We'll see, I doubt it will be in our lifetimes, but one day they'll be gone, hopefully. Smallpox was the first major infectious disease to literally be wiped from the face of the earth and we undeniably have vaccines to thank for that. Pro or anti-vax, you can't deny the facts there. All the other vaccines that have been created over the years were built on the back of the smallpox vaccine and the effectiveness and the technology behind that. But that's a topic for a future video. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I really hope you found this as interesting as I did. Again, keep it nice in the comments. Discussion, good. Being a crazy person, bad. Thank you. I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.